playing. Can um, I invite us all together just to pray right now? And uh, we're going to pray. Yeah, if you've got a heavenly prayer language, I want to encourage you. Let's pray and let's really invite and ask the Lord to come and speak through this time, speak through His Word this morning. So would you pray with me now? Let's pray in one voice, in unity. Father, we welcome You. We welcome You in this house, Lord. And with one voice, we join together and we say, come and speak. Come and speak through Your Word, God. We welcome it. We, we, we want the tough stuff. We want the encouraging stuff. We want it all, Father. We're saying yes to receiving Your Word. Come and speak by the power of Your Spirit. We pray, mighty God. And we pray that everyone here today, everyone joining us online, even those who are watching this in the future, Father, will receive something from You, God. It's the Holy Spirit, come and remove the things right now that would stand in the way of us receiving what You have to say to us, Lord. We see this time there's this seed that's being scattered out, God. And we wanna receive it, Father. We want it to go down deep and we wanna see it grow and bear fruit for the sake of Your Name and Your Kingdom. We pray this in the mighty Name of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Thanks, church. Put your hands together for Peter one more time for me. What a champion. All right, well, here we are. And um, I want you to know that we are right in the middle of our 40 days of prayer and fasting. We've called this season Align and Revive. And uh, I know that it's felt like a long 20 days already for many people, myself included. But I really feel that I've got a word to bring to us today for those who are in this season of fasting. But even for those, if you haven't jumped on board with that, that's totally fine. I still believe there is a word to really encourage you today. And uh, we're going to jump into this passage in Matthew 4 today. And in some Bibles, you'll see that it's called uh, the temptation of Jesus. In other Bibles, it might say Jesus is tested in the wilderness. And I was thinking about this this week and I was thinking about temptation. And uh, I know that it's something that we all feel and we're all challenged by at times, but we had a birthday in the house this week. My beautiful wife, uh, we celebrated another year. Let's say that, okay? <laughs> and uh, one of Alyssa's love languages is cheesecake. And so one of our daughters is an amazing cook. She cooked this cheesecake. And it's not just any cheesecake, but this is a white chocolate cheesecake. And I'm not a cheesecake guy, I'm not a sweets dessert guy, but this cheesecake is heavenly, right? And so on Tuesday night for family dinner, we had some cheesecake for the birthday, but there was a whole stack left over. So it goes in the fridge and all week, like this cheesecake is calling to everyone in our house, right? And um, our fridge door at the moment, three teenagers in our house, like it's always open and uh, someone's hungry, right? And so they open the fridge door and there's the cheesecake just calling to them. And I was fascinated to watch the interactions with people and the cheesecake, <laughs> right? And so we have someone in our home who's a real sweet tooth and it was just, it was kind of like, well, the cheesecake's there, I want some, I'm having some. And it's like when you start to cut those pieces, most people, you know, cut this little slice, it's like a slab of cheesecake and it's like slapped on the plate. And anyway, there goes a chunk of the cheesecake, right? But we've, we've got another child who is uh, right into kind of health and fitness at the, at the moment. And I noticed that she had this strategy where she'd get the cheesecake out, it would go on the bench and she'd take a little teaspoon and she'd just kind of scrape some from the edge, the last edge that had been cut. 
and uh, eat away at it. And then she'd just break off a little bit of like the, the crumbly bit. And it was like none has even gone missing, <laughs> right? And so in her mind, she's like, I basically haven't had any and no one would ever know even if I had, right? And then you've got my wife. And as I said, her love language is cheesecake. So it's her cheesecake and uh, there's no more cheesecake anymore, <laughs> right? But I realised that all of us feel temptation in different ways at different times And today we're going to have a look at this passage and we're going to see that even Jesus was faced with temptation. And in Hebrews 4.15, it actually says this about Jesus. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses. For he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. And that scripture is there to really bring us some comfort in the times where we are feeling the weight of standing against temptation to know that our Lord and Saviour, the one who we've worshipped today, the one who we've acknowledged in coming together in communion, he actually faced temptations just as we did. And he was able to push through them without sinning. And so today we're going to have a look at God's Word. I hope that we're going to find some tools today that are going to help equip us for a season of fruitfulness. And so I've called this message, Get Out of Here. All right? Get out of here. And this is a turn to your neighbour moment. All right? Just turn to your neighbour and tell them, get out of here. Or you can like, you know, change it like a bit like someone just said something surprising and you're like, get out of here. (laughs) But now just tell them, stay, stay, don't leave. Stay for the message. You're going to see why it's called that. Matthew chapter 4, starting at verse 1. We're going to read this whole scene here. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights he fasted and became very hungry. 40 days and 40 nights. If anyone here is very hungry because of our fasting season, Jesus is with you. During that time, the devil came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, no, the scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple and said, if you are the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say he will order his angels to protect you and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Jesus responded, the scriptures also say you must not test the Lord your God. Next, the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I will give it all to you, he said, if you will kneel down and worship me. Get out of here, (laughs) Satan, Jesus told him. For the scriptures say... You must worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Now, you notice I didn't get you to tell the person next to you, like call them Satan or anything like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, stay with me. Verse 11, then the devil went away and angels came and took care of Jesus. What an amazing scene, right? This is parallels in this scene that we read about Jesus with both Adam and the nation of Israel. And it's great that we've just done a series in Exodus because we're up to speed with the story of Israel. And we know, we can see here that God led Israel into the desert, into the wilderness for 40 years And it was a process of them learning to trust him, to know who he is. And he made a covenant with them in that space. And here we see that God led Jesus into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. And maybe right now, 
here today, you are feeling like God has led me into the wilderness. In 20 days now, I've been in the wilderness. I'm on this journey as well. But to give you the context of this passage, as we look at it in Matthew, we see that Jesus has just been baptised. It's this amazing scene. We see him get baptised, the heavens open. And then we see the Holy Spirit lead him into the wilderness for 40 days and nights. After this scene, then we see Jesus move straight into his ministry. The life that God has called him to of serving him. And I'm sure many of us have experienced a similar pattern in our lives before. A pattern where we take this step of obedience for the Lord or maybe we have an amazing encounter for the Lord or something significant happens in our life. There's breakthrough in a certain area and then we find ourselves in the wilderness being tested and challenged by the enemy in many different ways only to get through that and to walk into a new season with the Lord. That's going to be really familiar for some people here. I want you to know this. As you put God first in your life, the enemy is going to come and the enemy is going to try and tempt you to sin. He knows that sin gets between you and God and he wants to get us as far away from God as he can. He's going to entice you to take shortcuts. And I'm not talking about, you know, following Google to get home the quickest. I'm talking about doing things in a timing that is not the Lord's timing and taking things into our control. The enemy is going to want want you to pursue things that are not God's plan. Distractions. They might even look like good things. One of my all-time favourite quotes comes from a guy, his name's Francis Chan. He's an amazing Christian leader. And he says this, Our greatest fear should not be of failure, but of succeeding at things in life that don't really matter. Isn't that good? So if we take that another step forward, that kind of concept, then we could say we don't want to succeed at anything that is not close to God's heart, right? But the enemy would love us to be distracted. I think what's interesting with this text, you notice that Jesus, he wasn't tempted while he was in the temple. He wasn't tempted while he was at his baptism. But he's led into the wilderness and he was tempted while he was alone, while he was tired, while he was hungry. Right? Now, let's do a show of hands. Has anyone here ever felt alone? (laughs) Has anyone ever here felt tired? (laughs) Some people today. Has anyone here ever felt Hungry? Does anyone here maybe get their hangries as well? (laughs) The enemy loves to come when we're vulnerable. Maybe it's stress and things that are going on in life and it's weighing us down. Maybe it's tiredness. Maybe it's a big decision that's coming up. But the enemy loves to come in those times when we're vulnerable. Now, for some people here, uh, temptation is going to be really obvious, right? Uh, Maybe right now you're fasting and you're fasting social media and like all day long your phone is just right there. And all you want to do is just pick it up and just have a good old scroll, right? Be like, no, I'm fasting from this right now. All day long it's just calling out to you. Maybe no one would even know, right, if you did. Like only God would know, really, right? Or maybe maybe you're fasting food or a meal right now and like us, you know, the cheesecake is in the fridge. And you're just looking at it and you think, like, I am hungry. 
Um, I'm thinking about trying to turn some rocks into bread right now. (laughs) And this cheesecake is here, right? But for some people, it's not going to be so obvious. And you're thinking, no, I don't know if it's temptation I'm necessarily wrestling with. But I want you to see this. Maybe it's just less obvious for you. Because the temptation is to go to created things to get what I can find in my creator. And so maybe that's comfort in some way. Maybe it's joy in some way. Maybe it's just like relaxation, you know. Maybe it's love, value, peace. All these things, we can go to other things rather than going to the Lord. We have this temptation right now, I need some joy. Where am I going to for that joy, right? So we all experience temptation in different ways. There are three areas we see in our text today that the enemy loves to target. Number one, loves to target our physical needs and desires. Two, loves to target our principles and identity and our possessions and our power. Our physical needs and desires, the first temptation that the enemy gives to Jesus is to turn the rocks into bread because he was hungry. But Jesus says, no way. The scriptures say, people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And there's this parallel here in this scene with Israel and Jesus, because if you remember the the Israelites, they got led out into the desert. They got into the desert, the wilderness, and they were hungry. Like, where is the food, Moses? We're hungry. And Moses goes to the Lord. He's like, the people are hungry. What's going to happen here? And God's like, I'm going to give you bread. I'm going to be your provider. And so manna comes from heaven. Every morning they go out and they collect this substance, this bread-like substance. But they can only collect enough for one day. If they're greedy and they collect more than that, then it spoils. So each day they have to trust the Lord for the provision of the bread they need that will satisfy their physical hunger. God is teaching them something in this space. He can be trusted. He can provide. Who would have ever thought that bread would just appear on the ground, right? Well, God knew. God knew. They're thinking, like, what the heck is God going to do? How's God going to feed all of us? Millions of people out here in the wilderness and God's like, I've got a way. I've got a way. I can do it. And you're going to learn that I can do those things. Things that will blow your mind, miracles that you've never seen. I can do those things. So the enemy says to Jesus, just, just turn these rocks into bread and you can eat. He hadn't eaten for 40 days. I don't know if anyone here has done a 40-day fast, but that's legit, right? And he has the power to actually do what the enemy is asking him to do. Now, if you think about it, eating wasn't a sin. Food wasn't a sin. Even turning the rocks into food was not necessarily a sin. But Jesus could recognise that it was not the time or the place to do what the enemy was saying. He hadn't been led in the wilderness to eat. He'd been led into the wilderness to fast. It was something the Holy Spirit was doing and leading him to do. And so in that moment, he realised these things aren't necessarily bad, but they're not what God wants for me right now in this time. And there are times that each one of us are going to be tempted to satisfy a desire in us, maybe even a good, maybe even a natural desire, but we're going to be tempted to satisfy that desire in the wrong way or at the wrong time. And that's when it moves outside of God's plan. Now, I've got to talk about it, right? Okay, we're talking about sex. Okay, it's a beautiful example of this these human desires that people have. And in this day and age, people just think, well, uh, you know, you've got to try before you buy. That's the world that we live in. You wouldn't buy a car without driving at first, right? So we've got to give this thing a spin. 
But outside of the context of marriage, the Lord says, this is where these desires are met. I have created a space for it in marriage. So great desires, desires that are fine, but the need can be met in the wrong way at the wrong time. Are you with me? We can apply this to so many areas of our life. All right, number two, the enemy loves to target our physical needs and desires, our principles and our identity. So the enemy says to Jesus, if you are the son of God, jump off this high point and the scriptures say the angels will catch you. So Jesus used scripture to fight the enemy in the first temptation. Now the enemy is getting cheeky and he's using scripture to try and get Jesus to do what he wants him to do. But Jesus is smarter than that. What's he thinking trying to get Jesus? And Jesus says, well, the scriptures also say don't test God. So the reason that Jesus could defeat the enemy in this temptation is because he knew the scriptures. He didn't just know verse, the verse of the day. He didn't just know a one-off verse, but he knew context He had an understanding of what the Scriptures were actually saying, the heart of the Scriptures. And he knew this principle. We are called to honour God. So the enemy thinks he can take one verse, but Jesus knows the heart of what God is actually trying to say. You know, people these days, we can all use Scripture and we can take something out of context and we can use it in some way for our benefit. We're going to miss the heart of what God's saying through his word if we do that. And so we need to know the word of God, right? The enemy loves to challenge our principles, the things that we value, the things that we stand for in the Lord. And he loves to give us an offer that looks close and really good, but it's just slightly off, right? And so he might say to you, you know, if, if you just do a few more cashies on the side, the tax man's never going to know about it. If you just declare a little less money over here, if you claim a little more over here, whatever it looks like, then you're going to have more money in your hand. And guess what? Then you can be more generous as well. Like you can tithe more. Isn't that great? And you're sitting there and you're considering this thing, man, that would be good, right? New car, tithing more. And the challenge is like we have chosen to honour God with our finances. And that just doesn't sit right with us. That's a shortcut that we're not willing to take. And so we're going to trust God for the provision and he's going to give us what we need so we can be generous, Right? He loves to challenge our principles. You know, he loves to challenge our identity. Did you notice this phrase he keeps using? He says, so if you are the son of God, if you're the son of God, yeah, he did the same thing in the garden with Eve. He said, did God really say Like just challenge something that had come out of the Lord's mouth. And here we are. Remember the context. Jesus has just been baptised. As he comes out of the water, the heavens open, the voice of God speaks and he says, this is my beloved son who I am well pleased with. God has spoken Over Jesus, you are my son. Shortly after the enemy is questioning, if you're the son of God, well, yeah, I'm the son of God. God just told me that himself, right? He loves to challenge our identity. And this happens to us all the time, all the time. Maybe something you read in the word and then you receive it and it equips you and strengthens you. And then shortly after that, there's something happening in your life that is challenging that and trying to pull it away from you. Or maybe you come to church and 
someone's praying for you or prophesying over you and they speak a word over you, a blessing over you. This is who you are. This is who the Lord sees you are. And you receive it, it strengthens you in the spirit. And then you walk out the door, and you get in your car and you get home and straight away something happens that challenges that exact thing. This stuff happens all the time for us. The enemy loves to challenge our identity. All right, number three, he loves to target our possessions and power. As some of you have already felt this in different ways over this season of fasting. And um, for some people, it's the comfort that we find in possessions and power. It's something that makes us feel good, it makes us feel safe, it makes us feel powerful. And so the enemy comes to Jesus in this final temptation and he uses compromise. He tries to get Jesus to receive the whole world if he just worships the devil. And we already know through our series, our Exodus series, compromise costs. Jesus knows that if I go down this track, the redemptive plan of God that God has called me to is gone. I'm choosing a whole nother path here. Why would he want to do that? And so the enemy loves to come, loves to encourage us to be greedy, loves to encourage us to look at what other people have and want that. And I tell you this, any time we give in to that space, it is a gratitude killer. It is so hard to be grateful for what God has given us when we're lusting after more all the time. Enemy loves us in that place, loves it. Did you notice that it was the Holy Spirit who led Jesus out into the wilderness? And so for 40 days and nights of hard stuff, it was the Holy Spirit who had led Jesus into that. I think most of us like to think that when, when, when the Holy Spirit leads us into something, it's like the calm waters right, the green pastures. Thank you, Lord, for leading me into this space. But 40 days of prayer and fasting, like tough stuff. Holy Spirit, you led me into this, right? And God leads us into these times, these seasons that are hard because he wants to see us grow. And he knows that we're going to grow through the challenge and that it's actually going to be good for us. It's going to be fruitful in some way. So I want you to hear this today. If you are here today and if you're fasting and if you're finding it hard, it should be hard, right? You've taken something prayerfully and you've, you've asked the Lord, what am I going to remove from my life for this season of time? And God's pointed something out. You're going without and you're like, oh my goodness, this is hard. And suddenly you've taken something away that was giving you something in return. And now you have this process where someone said the other day, it's like the lights get turned on. And some people haven't realised that that stuff's always there, right? It's just that now the lights are on. Now we can see it because we've taken some things out of the way so we can see it. I'm one of these people who wake up in the middle of the night, if I have to go to the loo or through the house for whatever reason, I don't have to turn the lights on. There's this map inside my brain that just knows where everything is. I can walk through the house. I I can keep my eyes closed. Maybe every now and then I just touch a wall and I go, yeah, I know where I am right here. The problem is sometimes someone leaves a vacuum in the middle of the hallway, (laughs) right? Or... Maybe the dishwasher's finished at the end of the night and someone's opened the dishwasher door, right, so the dishes can dry. And I'll be walking around and then there's this almighty crash in the middle of the night. I didn't know it was there. 
We're in this season in fasting where it's a similar sort of thing, where there's these things that are now being exposed because we're removing other things that we have depended on to provide something that essentially we can find in our Creator. And it's hard. It's hard. Those things probably have a level of ease to access what they give us. And so instead of finding joy in those things, relaxation in those things, now I've got to try and learn, God, I feel like I have this need for something right now and I need to learn how I can find that in you. And when it's a new thing and it's unfamiliar, it may feel hard. But I want you to hear this. It's going to get easier and it's good. God is leading us into good places. I'm going to get the team up and I'm just going to wrap up. I want you to see a couple of things, all right? We've been looking at, we've just been giving the enemy a lot of credit, this whole message. Okay, I understand that. But it's important that we actually see these things because we need to be able to identify them in our lives if we're going to respond to them, right? So then the big question is, how do we respond to temptation? Jesus is really clear on a few things. Number one, if you were to read this same account in the book of Luke, it says Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, was led into the wilderness by the Spirit. So how do we face temptation? Our starting point is to be full of the Holy Spirit. So if we neglect our spiritual life, then we're already going to be in a difficult place to fight the temptations in front of us. So Jesus comes into this space, He's full of the Holy Spirit. He knows Scripture and He uses it. The truth of God. If we don't have an awareness of the truth of God, how are we going to use it to stand where God wants us to stand? Jesus comes and He understands who God has called Him to be. You know what? Maybe he could have turned the rocks into into bread. Maybe that high point on the temple, he could have thrown himself off and the angels would have caught him. But that's not what God had for him. Jesus knew his heavenly Father and he knew that right now, this, this is not what God is calling me to. He was clear on that. We need to be a people who know our heavenly Father. Is this something that God is calling me to? Is this, is this right in God's eyes for me now? Is this what you want, Lord? I love that what we see in Jesus is that He is just not interested in entertaining the enemy. Just get out of here, Satan. Like, you're just annoying me. I've got my 40 days of prayer and fasting. It's hard enough and then you rock up, right? Like, rack off. We need to be people who who are able to identify those things. See them. Just say to the enemy, rack off. I'm not having a bar of that. You're wasting your time. Get out of the way so the angels can come and tend to me. That's what I'm looking for. James 4, 7 says, Humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come close to God and God will come close to you. I want you to know that this is a season where maybe you're feeling the stretch 
whether you're in this season of prayer and fasting or not, just challenges in life that the enemy is coming after you while you're vulnerable. I want you to hear this today, that there is strength to be found in the Lord. And our, our, our journey in this time is to identify where we have needs and to go to the Lord for them. And as we do it, you're gonna find a rich blessing. Maybe things you never knew, I can find this in the Lord. Oh my goodness, this is amazing. Things that you couldn't learn in any other way. And so I want you to hear this today, stand strong. Stand strong in the Lord. He has everything you need and it might look like it's so hard right now and it's even impossible and things have been exposed in your life that you don't even know how to deal with right now, but God does. Your mind is seeing those things and thinking, I wanna go to the Lord, but how can He even provide those things? And God's thinking, well, I know, I can do it. I can do it, just wait and see what I have for you. So I wanna invite you to jump on your feet. We're gonna sing in just a moment. I just wanna read this verse from Isaiah over you. As I finish up, this is one of my go-to scriptures in the seasons where I'm just feeling like, Lord, this is hard. This is hard and I need You. I need You. So you might just wanna close your eyes or stretch out your hands to receive this. Isaiah 40 verse 28 says, Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the Creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary and His understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, a young man stumble and fall, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles, they will run and not grow weary, they will walk and not be faint. Father, help us to look to You in those times where we feel like we don't have it or we don't know the way. We just don't have the strength to fight, Father. Help us, God. Holy Spirit, come, fill us afresh. Show us, Lord, what this relationship, this rhythm of grace looks like, God, so that we can find everything that we need in You. We pray this in the mighty Name of Jesus. Amen.